This is advanced masking. So advanced masking doesn't mean that the things we cover will be necessarily difficult. It just means that the tasks that we have, people will consider to be difficult. Uh, as an example, here's a little uh, cup. How do you move the background on it? Uh, if you have basic masking skills, that's going to be a challenge for you because whatever's behind it uh, is usually stuck in there with it. And if you just make a selection around the edge, copy it, and put it in another document, my hand would still be showing through it, right? I want to take this glass, lift it up, and be able to put anything I want behind it as a new background. And so that's what I, an example of what I consider to be advanced masking. Uh, other example would be uh, hair. You know, if somebody has blonde hair blown in the wind and you have little wisps of it, some of them might be even partially transparent, especially if they're in motion, uh, how do you get it where you can remove the background there without giving them a haircut and without making it look like you used an X-Acto knife to cut them out, you know, where it looks artificial? Um, those are the kind of tasks. Some of those things are difficult, uh, but most of them are very manageable if you simply know where in Photoshop to go to do it. To remove the background on this glass would take me most likely, well, if I did it without describing it and tried to go as fast as I can, I could probably do it in a minute. Um, there's a small chance I could do it in less, maybe even 30 seconds. Uh, but you got to know how to do it. You got to know these features. And so we need to get a foundation of knowledge first on how we think about all the features uh, because I've been using Photoshop for 20 years and so for me all the the basic features are I don't know they're as familiar to me as using a pen and paper uh, but I need to make sure that you know all the the basic parts and all the little tricks when it has to do with the basic concepts before we push into those more advanced ideas so for me advanced masking means what a lot of people would consider to be difficult but it doesn't mean that the actual steps you have to go through have to be hard. Um, having said that, I do expect some people to get lost at some point where things will go over their head, but I hope that won't be the majority of the class, just certain areas, because in advanced masking, we gotta push it. So I'll make sure that those of you that haven't done a lot of masking in the past, will get a lot of value out of it. You can get over your head on occasion. Those of you that used it for a long time, I'm gonna fill in all the little gaps in your knowledge and push you harder, even into uh, more advanced stuff. So we'll have a wide variety. To start off with, I want to start with the basic selection tools and show you tricks about using them. Sometimes there are hidden keyboard shortcuts where you hold down some weird key and it does something you're probably not aware of. And once you know those things, those basic selection tools become much more useful. And then once we've covered that, then we'll start progressing into more intermediate and advanced ideas. Sound good? All right. So if you want to see a few examples, uh, if we look at my screen, uh, I'm just going to cycle through a few images. And just so you know, today, I think there's only one image that I can think of offhand of all the images I've used that I've ever worked on before, meaning I'm, I haven't tried anything experimented other than the image that I used for hair. I needed a promo for the class, and I think I've used it before. Um, but uh, I want to be challenged by this so that if I would run into a problem, I run into the problem. I'll show you how I deal with it or tell you the direction I'd head. So here are some examples. Uh, in this case, this is me doing light painting in Iceland with uh, molten steel wool. I'm spinning molten steel wool uh, in molten uh, metal is flying off of it. What if I want to isolate that orange thing and put it on a new background? And doesn't that sound like something would be a little bit difficult to do with all its little you know, things and loopies and all that kind of stuff? Well, we'll see if I can figure out how to do it. <laughs> if we have time, you know, don't, not everybody needs to do that. So for me, it's not critical we get to this image, but it's an example of something that I would consider to be an advanced masking task, okay? Uh, okay, this is a chunk of iceberg that has melted and it's sitting up on the beach. I want to put a blue background behind it. If I put a blue background behind it, I need to be able to see through it to the blue. Ooh, that doesn't sound like a simple task, right? Well, that's just like doing a glass, uh, plastic glass. Uh, here, I just might need a, a shape. This shape that's around here is a simpler task, but it might need that edge to be really crisp and perfect, uh, so that if I put it on something else, it might almost be as crisp on the edge as a logo. Then you gotta make sure you're thinking about it right to do it. I'm not sure if I'll do this or not, but I wanna remove the background on that rainbow, put it in a different picture. Uh, here, I think that sky is too darn boring. And no, those aren't full-size houses. They're little bitty. You can tell by what's uh, here. But this is in Iceland. I found that. I thought it was cute. 
and uh, the sky's too boring. I might want to pop in a new sky, but if I do, all these little blades of grass and things, they're going to need to combine with that new sky and, and look appropriate. Um, don't know why I have that there. <laughs> Here, I might want to remove the background on those clouds and put them in a different photo because maybe I just have a plain old uh, blue sky and I need something more interesting. But I'm not going to use this part of the blue sky. I'm going to use the blue sky from another photo. Uh, maybe it's got something in it, a plane going by or something else, and I need it to be in there. But this has really soft edges, and you can see some of them are much lighter. Uh, it's going to be a little more difficult. Uh, here, I need to use that for a logo. Right now it's a physical object, and if you look at it, the difference between the actual text that's here and the backdrop uh, is not very great. Uh, fire. I want to make it look like there's flames coming off the top of my head. Uh, so I want to steal the flames out of this photo and make it look good on top of another photo. Uh, just a few other ones. Uh, I don't know, if I want to select something like this with its overly intricate thing around it and you have to see through certain parts, how do you select it? So you can pop it somewhere else. Um, anyway, does that give you some idea of some of the uh, tasks we might need to accomplish? We'll also do simpler stuff, which will be just, I have a logo, I need to have a transparent background around it. It doesn't have to be overly advanced, but here's just a range of pictures that we might use. Uh, like here, I want to put a new sky in there and keep all the, the smoke and be able to see through it to the new background. Okay? So just that gives you an idea of some of the things that uh, we might want to try to accomplish, and then we got to figure out how to do it. But we're going to start off more basic, because I find oftentimes people look for something advanced when they really need something overly simple. Uh, so let's take a look. I'm going to start off with the basic selection tools and tell you tricks about them, how to make them much more useful. So we'll start with the most basic uh, one I can think of, which is the marquee tool. The marquee tool, if I just zoom up on it here, uh, if I click and hold on it, there's more than one version. We can either make rectangles, ovals, uh, or a single pixel tall or a single pixel wide selection. It seems pretty simple, but there's a lot more to it than just that. So when I go over here and I click and drag, I might need to make my selection. And let's say I needed to select this little sign that says gas. By the way, this is the teapot gas station. I'm trying to remember where the heck it was. It's, in, it's either in, I think it's in Oregon or Washington. Uh, wherever it is, if you uh, Google the, uh, I think it was the International Hop Museum. Like hops is in what you make beer out of. It was real close to there. <laughs> but uh, let's say I need to make a selection. I'm going to make a basic one in a similar shape to this. Might not perfectly line up, but let's find out. I'll click in this corner here, and I'll start to drag like this. And you know, you can make your rectangle, but what if wherever you initially clicked was not exactly where you wanted to? You were off a little bit. This is especially common if you're using the elliptical marquee. With that tool, watch, if I click right on the corner of this sign and start to drag, look at what it becomes. It's nowhere near my selection when I'm done. See how far away the selection is from where I originally clicked? I originally clicked in the upper left of that sign. Well, right now, Photoshop is actually thinking about a rectangle as if this circle or oval is inside of a rectangular shape, and I clicked where the upper left corner would be. And that's also where my mouse is right now, the lower right corner. So that means in order to select something like this globe, I'd have to act as if it was a rectangle. So if I put this in a rectangular box, think about where the corner would be. Well, it could come out this way, and up here, it'd be right about there, wouldn't it? So if I click there and start to drag, the problem is, what if I'm off a little bit and it wasn't the exact right spot? Well, don't let go of the mouse button. Don't let go. So you're still making your selection and try this. Hit the space bar. For the time you have the space bar held down, you can move the selection around your screen. And I still have the mouse button down. I've never let go. Let go of the space bar and you're still making your selection. So why not get it to be approximately the right size Hit the space bar and just reposition it. Get the top in the right spot, the left edge on the right spot. Let go of your space bar and continue resizing your selection. Now that particular globe there is not perfectly round, so I'm not going to be able to get this to align right now. But you get the idea that if you didn't get the corner quite right, you could hit the space bar and move it around. Ben? Yes. Uh, Zilla, Washington? Zilla? That sounds right. Zilla. Yeah. Zilla, okay. Did you know that off the top no, of your I head, or did you Google it? Googled it. Yeah, I, yeah. Knew, I knew you would. 
<laughs> and I have a comment to make. This yeah. is a comment from uh, Mr. Picasso, who asked if there's any possibility of you identifying when a CS6 feature is not possible in CS5, or when a CS6 only feature is used, can the alternative be mentioned? I'll try to remember okay. that. Uh, okay. The vast majority of what we use will be available in almost any newer version of Photoshop. Perfect. There might be a couple of tiny things that are only in CS6, and I'll try to remember to, to mention that. All right, thank you. Um, what we're using right now would probably be in Photoshop like two or something. Uh, so uh, anyway, so I got this. Well, the problem is sometimes when you're trying to select something like this, it's not gonna be a perfect circle or oval. So check this out. Once you've made your selection, you can go to the Select menu, and under the Select menu is a choice called Transform Selection. Transform Selection. That is going to let you resize your selection just like you'd resize any picture if you transformed your picture. I can sit here and pull on this, you know, resize it, pull on this, resize it, but it's still going to be more of a normal oval. It's not going to be a, a really odd shape. So let me choose, I'm just going to hit the escape key to remind you where I got that. I went to the select menu and I chose transform selection. But then here, let's push it further. After you've chosen transform selection from the select menu, you can press the right mouse button on your mouse and you'll get a list of the kinds of transformations you could apply. So you're not limited in just pulling a corner and having it resize it as if you were using the tool to begin with. And one of the choices I like to use in here is called distort. I just pressed the right mouse button when I was in Transform Selection. Now I can pull each corner independently so I'm not stuck with a perfect circle or oval and that often makes it so I can be much easier with lining things up if I'm able to distort that so it's not just limited to what the tool would usually be able to create. Now, usually I'd be zoomed in, and I would make sure that this is right on there, but right now we're talking about concepts, right? It doesn't matter. We're not going to save this and frame it. So I'm not always going to make perfect selections. I'm just going to try to give you an idea, a concept, that you can use later to spend more time with and make a perfect one, okay? When you're done, I just press return or enter, and now I have my selection. So do you see how I took a basic selection tool and made it much more useful? So the main thing is, if you're used to transforming things, you're used to going to the edit menu and going over here to free transform. Don't use that. If you use that, you'll transform your picture. Instead, go to the select menu and choose transform selection. Then you'll be able to pull on it to resize it. But you can only resize it when you first get in there. If you want to be able to do other kinds of transformations, you press the right mouse button. I mainly use distort and then I can pull those corners independently. Okay. So does that make that basic tool a little bit less basic? So that's just a simple idea, but let's see what else we can do. Now, let's say I need to add an area up here to this selection that we already have. Well, I might switch to a different selection tool. Since we're only talking about the marquee tool right now, I'll go to the rectangular marquee. And if I just make a selection up here, it usually replaces the one that already exists. You know, you're probably used to that if you've used Photoshop a little bit. Choose Undo, and I can have it instead add to the selection that already exists. And there's two general ways of doing that. One is to go to the top of my screen, and up here we have some icons. The icon on the left means when I click away from the selection that I currently have, make a brand new one. If I go to this one, it's going to add to the selection that's already there. If I do this one, it'll take away from it. And if I do this one, it'll intersect it, only giving me the areas where the two selections overlap. Okay? I can also access those same features using my keyboard. And I usually use my keyboard because I have to do it so frequently that moving my mouse to the top of the screen all the time would just slow me down. So I'll mention the keyboard shortcuts in just a moment. To add to a selection, you can either click on that second icon up there or just hold down the shift key. When you hold down the shift key, you'll see a little plus sign next to your cursor, and you could click and drag to add. I can continue holding shift and continue adding to my selection, and I can switch between different selection tools as well. But we haven't talked about other selection tools, so I'm not going there yet. To take away from my selection, uh, I would hold down the option key, which is Alt in Windows, and then I'd be able to take away. So let's say I want the middle of the sign to not be there. 
or I want this edge of the selection to not be there. So holding on option is going to take away. Holding down both of those modifiers at the same time, shift, which usually adds, and option, alt, and windows, which usually takes away, means give me the intersection of two selections, which means where they both overlap each other. So if I hold them both down, and then I just go across here like that, it says look at where this selection overlaps the one that was already there. Okay? That's going to be overly useful. Let me give you an example. Let's say I really needed to select this sign and that globe. Well, there are many different selection tools I can use, but I find that oftentimes combining multiple selection tools together can be the fastest. So I'm going to click here and make a general selection around the area that I'm thinking about. In fact, let's just get the globe. Then I'm going to switch to a tool we haven't used yet, but most people have used at some point, and that would be the magic wand tool. The magic wand tool, when you click on it, selects based on color, uh, and usually you just click and you get a selection. The problem is you're going to get a selection of a lot of stuff you done, didn't need. Choose undo. I like using the magic wand tool to take away from a selection I made with a different tool. So in this case, I have my selection already here. I'm going to use the magic wand tool, and I'll hold down the key that takes away. The key that takes away was Option, Alt, and Windows. I'm just going to click right here on an area I didn't want selected, and boom, I have the sign and the globe selected, right? Does that make sense? Because the way the magic wand tool works is when I click, it makes selections based on either brightness or color. You click on an area and it says, I'm going to select the exact color that's underneath my mouse, and then I'm going to vary a little bit from that uh, to go a little brighter, a little darker, a little different in color. So I can click and select like this area here, or this area over here, but it does it based on color. So why not make a bigger selection and then just use that tool to take away from it? Option, boom, got it. Okay. So, like I say, I'm starting with simple ideas, though. For some of you, though, if you're used to basic selection tools and only using them in the obvious ways, where if you're self-taught, you might not know that kind of stuff, okay? Let's see, then, if I'm using any basic selection tool, usually when you click, it's going to start in the upper left corner. And you drag, if you drag down to the right, you get the lower right corner. It doesn't have to be that way. If instead you hold down the option key before you click, before you click the mouse, watch, I'll click right in the center of this globe. I'm holding on option, alt and windows. Now that's going to define the center of whatever it is you're making. So if you want a circle centered on something, sometimes if you want to select like an eyeball or something, it's easier to find the center than to find where the upper left corner of a rectangle would be that contains the eye. So you end up coming over here and grabbing your elliptical tool, and if it was easy to know where the center was, you hold on the option key, click in the center, and then start pulling out. Remember, you can also, you have to keep that option key held down, by the way, until you release the mouse button. Uh, otherwise, it'll stop thinking of it as the center. You can also, though, then hold down the space bar and move it. So you can combine any of these ideas we talked about. So option means go from the center. Then the other thing when you're using those tools is if you're clicking and dragging and you need a perfect circle or a perfect square, hold down the shift key. Shift constrains to a perfect circle or a perfect square. Okay? Now let's take a look at a few of the other tools. The lasso tool. How can we make it more useful? Well, let's look at a different portion of this image so we don't get too bored with uh, what we're working on. And the lasso tool, usually just click and drag and you create a free form shape just tracing out what you've drawn. If you don't create a complete shape, then Photoshop will close that shape for you by collecting, connecting the dots where you let go and where you started. Sometimes that can create odd looking uh, items if you're not in an obvious spot. You, know, you can get weird looking stuff. So usually I end up ending right where I began. So let's say I'm zoomed up on this to be really precise and I want to start selecting it. And I'm not going to be precise about it because that's not what I'm trying to teach you right now. But let's say that I'm following that. I get to the edge of my screen and what am I supposed to do? It's like, can't do anything. Well, when you're in the lasso tool, try pressing the space bar. With the space bar, you can scroll. 
So then you can continue going down here. I haven't released the mouse button yet. And then I can hit the space bar and scroll. I can keep going, selecting this. Imagine I was precise there. But doesn't that make the lasso tool a little bit more useful? If you weren't aware of that, then the lasso tool can be a real pain. Okay, then with the lasso tool, there's actually two uh, main versions of it, and that is there is the lasso tool and there's the polygonal lasso tool. By polygonal, it means that it makes straight lines, straight line segments. So you could come over here and click on the edge of this and then just kind of do it as a series of clicks. You see a lot of people doing this and clicking a gazillion times to go around the edge of something. You can press the space bar again, you can scroll. But polygonal lasso is going to make straight lines. Not so useful here when we have a curved shape. Might have been more useful up, if we get back up to that sign, up here where we have more straight uh, areas. I could click on the corner of this, go to the next area that changes, and just kind of click on each corner of where things are. Imagine I'm getting that just right. OK, so you probably used the polygonal lasso tool before. But bummer, right here, that really shouldn't be a polygon. It's curved, right? What I could do is just go right across it like this and later on come back with the, um, the what do you call it, circular marquee tool and say take away, take away that top part. Or check this out, here's the trick. When you're using the polygonal lasso tool, if you want to make a freeform shape where you just draw it, what you want to do is get to the point right where you want to start drawing freeform and you want to hold down the Option key. If you hold down the Option key when you're in the um, polygonal lasso, and in fact, actually, you probably don't even need to. Let me find out. No, you do need to. I was thinking it might have simplified it over a few versions, but no. Hold down the Option key, then click. And now I'm making a freeform shape where I can just trace around this edge. When I'm done, let go of that Option key, and we're back making a polygonal selection. So if you want to see it a little bit easier, I'll do it out here where you don't see the object. And that is, I'm just clicking like this to make straight lines. If I click and drag, it just means it's waiting for me to let go to know where to put that corner. But if I hold on Option, now I can draw a freeform shape for as long as I want, as long as I have Option held down. Let go of Option and my mouse, and now I'm back making freeform shapes. Okay? The same thing is true when you're using the normal lasso tool. With the normal lasso tool, you make straight line or make a freeform shape like this. If you want to make straight lines, hold down the option key. Just make sure you have the option key held down before you let go of the mouse button and keep the option key held down the whole time once you start making straight lines. And if you want to go back to a freeform shape, just click the mouse button and you can start dragging. Doesn't matter if you have an option held down or not. And so therefore, you can have a complex object that has, needs a freeform shape, and then you run into a spot that needs really straight lines that wouldn't be convenient for you to draw by hand. So you hold on the Option key. Start clicking, clicking, clicking to get those straight lines. And then remember, if you get close to the edge of your screen, that it means that you're going to uh, scroll. And I think the two of them ends up making it much more convenient. Another thing is, if you're not used to using the polygonal lasso tool and you accidentally click on your image and start making a selection, it's just going to keep going forever. I mean, you're like, how the hell do I get out of this thing? It doesn't matter where you click. Go over here and try to click on a tool to change. No, it's going to click on your picture and think you're still making it. Just hit the escape key to say, get me out of this thing. Okay? Escape gets you out. Or you can also uh, double click. Double clicking would finish the selection. Escape gets you out and throws away the selection. Double clicking finishes it. Or just click where you started, like to actually create a closed shape. All right, then we have another selection tool. Zoom up on these pumps. Unfortunately, these pumps are really fake. This is just a plastic insert. There's, these numbers couldn't twirl. Uh, all right, I'm going to come in here. We have a third lasso tool that is called the magnetic lasso. The magnetic lasso tries to cling to the edges of things, um, but there's a little bit you need to know about in order to use it properly. So let's zoom in. 
And let's see if I can get it to help us to select the top portion of this pump. With the magnetic lasso tool, you take the, the little um, triangle that's there. Let me see if I can zoom up on the cursor. You see the cursor has a little triangle next, next to it. The tip of that triangle is where you're clicking. In older versions of Photoshop, I don't believe they had the triangle there. Instead, it would be the tip of where the rope ends is where you'd be cl clicking. They changed it to try to make it more obvious where you're clicking. With that, what I need to do is move it to the edge of an object, get it right on the edge, and then click and let go. And that tells it what you want to select. Think of it as magnetizing that object. Then if I stay close to the edge and go up like this, it will try to cling to that edge as long as I'm close enough. But the problem is, is it seems to not be all that useful because it like, seems to randomly do weird stuff. And that's because you're not seeing enough uh, if you just click and start using it. What you want to do, can escape here, is you want to press the caps lock key before you use it. And you want to leave the caps lock key turned on the whole time. If you don't have caps lock turned on, the tool seems to not make any sense at all. Don't ask me why, that's not the default setting because it should look like this. You'll see why in a moment. Now what you want to do if you have the caps lock key held down is there's a little crosshair in the middle of your cursor. You want to get that on the edge of the object. You want to click it right on the edge to magnetize that object. And now what your task is, is to go around that object and make sure the edge stays inside the circle. Ben, do you need to hold the caps lock down or just press no, it? No, caps lock's a toggle. Which, so you just press it, the little light on the key usually turns on and it just stays there. Yeah. So um, now my job is to trace around this pump and simply keep the edge inside the circle because it's only going to cling to those things that would be in the circle. So I can go over here and as long as I keep the edge in there, you don't let the thing leave that circle. Whoops. Okay. So it really messes up if you go too far away. And I'm not saying it's perfect here. There are other settings that we can use. But you get the idea that it's doing an okay job going around there uh, as long as I realize that there's a circle involved. Now I'm going to hit the escape key to undo that. There's more to it. At the top of your screen, there's a setting called width, and it determines how big the circle is. So if I want a bigger circle, I can just type in a higher number there. And I don't actually type a number in. I just click on the word width and drag left or right to change it. That's true of any time you see a number with the name of the number next to it in a panel, in a little palette or panel. Just click on the name and drag left or right to change it. So now I've got a bigger circle. I click the crosshair on the edge. I just need to keep the edge within that circle. Well, what I like to be able to do is sometimes I get into a tight spot. Let's say there's a second pump right next to this. and I don't want it to cling to that pump. I might get both pumps within the circle. So you can change how big that circle is while you're going around your image. And the way you do that is you use the square bracket keys on your keyboard, just like you would to change any brush size for any of your painting tools. So I can get, if I get into a tight spot where there's two of these pumps close together, uh, then I just get a smaller circle, one small enough that it's not going to overlap on both pumps. Make sense? Okay, then there is uh, another thing, and that is there is a frequency setting at the top of your screen, right up here. That means how often should I add those little anchor points that you see it add? Do you see those little squares that gets added? And what happens is if you have a really complex edge, like a tree or something else, it's not going to be adding those anchor points enough to make it accurate around there. It'll be more generalized. And you might notice that when I go over the top of the pump, it kind of generalized the shape. Let me see if I can zoom up there. Do you see how I missed that one little upturning area? And it's most likely because it wasn't adding enough of those dots. The frequency setting controls how often it puts those dots down. So I could bring the frequency way up. Now it's going to be able to do a much more intricate edge because it's going to be putting down a lot of those dots. So let's see if it's any better when I go around that top. Might or might not be. I'll just that's finish that's frequency by distance, not by time, right? Uh, I don't know the exact way it's thinking. It just means more frequently put it down. It's not like it's a, they're not evenly spaced. So I don't know the exact uh, if it just runs into detail and puts them down or what, but it means put down more of them more frequently. Uh, it still didn't get that perfect, 
But the main thing is the more complex the edge, the higher the frequency should be. Okay? And again, I just click on the word and drag. There's another setting, though, called contrast. And contrast says how big of a difference does there need to be between the object and its background uh, before it considers it to be an edge that it can cling to. So if you need to get things that are very similar, where the subject and background are real similar, you're going to have to lower the contrast. If th it starts selecting and, and grabbing too much, like it starts grabbing little clouds that are behind there in the sky and other detail that's not part of this pump, you probably need to bring the contrast up to say only cling to things that are more dramatically different. Okay? When you're doing this also, if it messes up, you're going around something and it, see how it added a dot out in the sky? You can just hit the delete key and it should delete the last dot it added and that way you can back up and keep going. But I don't want to spend too much time on that tool. I just wanted to let you know a few basic tips about it. With some things it's good, but it's a little low tech in, it, in the tool. The main thing is if you don't know about caps lock, then that tool just seems to be absolutely useless because you're not seeing what's going on. And I wanted to mention that you can change the size of the circle using your bracket keys. The other thing you can change is if you use the greater than and less than symbols, they look like uh, kind of sideways letter Vs, you know, um, you can change the contrast setting as you're going around. So that way if you get to an area that has a little bit of contrast between subject and background, you can lower that um, contrast so it can cling to it. You get to another area where it's selecting too much of stuff you didn't want, you could use the um, greater than and less than keys to increase the contrast. But those aren't obvious because how would you know? You just have to know that the, the uh, thing exists. Uh, let's see if there was anything else. Uh, when you're using that, if you run into an area where it just cannot handle it, uh, it's trying to cling to things, as with any lasso tool, you could hold down the option key and click, and now you're making a freeform shape. You're saying, I'll do that part manually because it just couldn't handle it. Then just let go of the option key and click again, and it would start clinging again. All right, then let's talk about, because those are our lasso tools. We only have a few more selection tools to go, then we get on to other things. So those of you that are bored know we'll move on in a minute. Um, all right, other things, and that is I can come in, and you remember how I had a selection around an area, and I used the magic wand tool, held down the option key, because option means take away, alt and windows, and took away from it, like that. Um, well, there's a setting involved, and that is if you have the magic wand tool active, there's a choice at the top that's called tolerance. And tolerance means how big of a difference can there be between the area that you clicked on and what I should select. So if tolerance is set to zero, it means select only the exact color that I'm clicking on. Wherever that color is found, select only that exact color. As you bring this up higher and higher, it means it can vary a little bit in brightness, vary a little bit in color, and it will still get selected. The highest this goes to, I think, is 255. And that has to do with how your image is made behind the scenes, which uh, hopefully we'll have time to get to a little bit later on today. One other setting up here, and that is a choice called uh, contiguous. If it's set to contiguous, which is the default setting, then it's only going to select one unbroken chunk of your picture. So if I use the magic wand tool and I do it inside the uh, little handle of the teapot, you see how it's an unbroken chunk? It can't leap over the handle, can't leap over that little wire that was there to get to other things. I'll deselect with Command-D. If I turn that off, then it can select across the entire screen, wherever it finds that color. So when I click here, we get a much larger area. And then as with any of the other tools, you can hold down the shift key to add to or the option key to take away. So I can just hold shift and get more of the sky, get more over here, and I can hold down option to try to take away. Uh, the only thing is you might want to turn that contiguous back on to say don't jump all the way over here and take away part of the sky or something else. You'd have to click a bunch over here to get rid of that though. But that tolerance setting is used in more areas than you would think. If I make a selection, let's say I select an area like this, 
there's a choice under the select menu called grow. Grow means make my selection larger, but only include colors similar to what I have in the selection. So when I choose grow, do you see how it's selected across a lot more of the sky? Well, that command, which was under the select menu, was called grow, it uses the tolerance setting in the magic wand tool to figure out how much it should vary from the colors you already have. So if I want it to be more precise, I could grab a magic wand tool, bring my tolerance to zero, and now that means only select colors that are exactly the same is what I have selected. So I make this selection like this with my tolerance of the magic wand at zero, grow. It's a much smaller area that it's, it's adding than if the tolerance was up at its default setting, which is 32. I'm not saying that's a great selection, but um, the other command that uses the tolerance setting of the magic wand tool is not just the grow feature, but the one called similar. The difference between the two is grow tries to create one unbroken chunk, meaning it can't leap across these telephone lines and get to the sky over here. It can't go inside the handle of the uh, thing because there's an obstruction that would make that two chunks, not one unbroken one. So if I choose grow, it means one unbroken chunk. If I choose similar, it means everywhere in the entire document. Although it didn't seem to go over that side anyway, because this is where closer to the sun, so this is brighter in the sky than there. If I do it with my tolerance set higher, I'll just put it up to the default, you might notice it a little bit more. Grow. Made it over there, but see how it didn't get inside the handle? Didn't get over here because this line here was a big enough obstruction. Choose undo. Similar. It did get inside the handle. It found colors in the middle of the teapot and that kind of thing. It looked across the entire document. So if you ever use Grow or Similar, know that if they seem to act a little bit odd any time you use it, it's because you did something with the magic wand tool a while ago and you changed the tolerance setting. And so it's not acting the way you'd expect, okay? I'm not saying grow and similar are the most useful commands, but sometimes they're really nice. If you got a, a logo, maybe, you select one little part of the logo, choose similar, you got the whole logo, as long as the background was a different color. Um, so in this particular case, it might not be the most useful tool, but it can be useful on occasion. All right, then, once you have a selection, let's say I had that top of the uh, sign selected, or maybe I had around this area here selected. Use my magic wand and take away. Got a nice little selection there. Isn't that much faster than tracing it with the lasso tool? Um, sometimes it's much easier to select what you don't want and then tell Photoshop to give you the opposite of it because what you do want might be overly complex. A blue sky is usually much simpler than anything else in the photograph. And if what you want is what touches the blue sky, sometimes select the blue sky, and then you can tell Photoshop to give you the opposite. So let's say I selected the blue sky over here. Just click on it like that. Blue sky is selected, but I really wanted the pumps and the trees and all that other stuff. You can go to the Select menu and choose Inverse. Inverse gives you the opposite. It's hard to tell, but right now this area is selected instead of the sky. But that's true with any selection tool. So if I get into advanced selection tools, know that oftentimes I'll simply look at what is simpler, the thing I wanted to select or everything else. And if everything else is simpler, then I'll switch my mindset and say, I'm gonna select that background and then choose inverse. So just a simple idea. So in this case, I want to select just the red band around this pump. So how could I do it? Well, I could make a selection like this, mindset-wise. Uh, use the magic wand tool, take away the sky, and take away the center. Right? So the magic wand tool, even though it's overly simple, uh, can be useful. Down here, I'll get rid of the, the white on the bottom. And it might take a couple clicks to do that because my tolerance would need to be a little higher. 
usually zoom in so I can actually see what I'm clicking on up there. But as it gives you the idea, a simple tool can make a more complex selection. Uh, let's see. Then, oftentimes you go to the select menu. And in the select menu, you have a choice called modify. And in modify, we have five commands. And I'd like to show you how you might want to replace these commands. What I find is that a lot of people have used um, Photoshop for a long time and just get stuck with the old way they used to do things. So I'll just quickly describe these and then I'll show you replacements for them. Border is going to select around the edge of what's currently selected. So if this is my selection, border. Now I only have this little area around it selected. The area in here is not, the area out here is not. You might think you'd never use that. Well, border is sometimes useful. You got an object, you've copied it from one document, you paste it into another document, and you can see a fringe around the edge. Well, there's a way to almost instantly select what's on a layer, and you can choose border to get that little bitty rim that is giving you troubles, and then hit delete or something else. It can be very useful. Smooth. Smooth is going to round the corners of things. Or if I have a free form selection, it is going to round off any sharp corners. You have to type in a number. And I don't know if you can tell or not, but it rounded off the corners. Right? So if you're ever trying to draw a freeform shape, you think it might be just a little bit raggedy, you could use that. Expand makes your selection bigger while keeping the same shape. It's like having a balloon full of air and you add some extra air. It just gets bigger. So I can expand this by 10, and I'm going to get a bigger selection of the same general shape. Careful with rectangles, it will start rounding the corners. Contract does the opposite. Make it smaller. And feather softens the edge. The problem is you have to type in a number and you're always guessing. You don't know the exact number to put in there. So there are replacements for most of those commands. And what I would like to get in my replacement for those commands is I would like a visual preview. When I choose um, expand, I want to see how much bigger is that going to look. If it gets that much bigger. If I choose feather, I want to see how soft is that edge. Does it match the edge quality of the object I'm trying to select? So one way of doing that that's in newer versions of Photoshop is to go to the select menu and choose refine edge. And when you choose refine edge from the select menu, this comes up. And the only problem is that your preview changes where I can't see my picture. So at the top up here, is your view mode. And if you click, you have many choices. You have the choice of marching ants. And so that's going to give you the same view we had a minute ago. And in here, I can go over here and the part called edge shift could make the selection larger or smaller. But in this case, I'm not really seeing it uh, because the amount, I don't know, it's not showing me in the preview. If I come over here though and choose something like overlay, and I use, hopefully this will work. Usually it does. I'm surprised the preview is not updating. Usually it does. Let's see if Feather will change it. Yes. Okay, for some reason it doesn't preview Shift Edge, which is really dumb. Uh, but here, if you feather it through the Refine Edge dialog box, you can visually see it as a red overlay. And you can guesstimate your setting much easier, and you don't have to think about just numbers. You can use a slider. But what you need to do is up here at the top, click, and there's a choice called Overlay. That's what I ended up using. Unfortunately, Shift Edge doesn't give me a preview. Well, it looks like it only does if I have a soft edge selection. That's really dumb. I thought it gave me a preview, but let me turn Feather down, and I'll find that if you don't have a soft edge, uh, then Shift Edge won't, won't preview or do things. 